Welcome to my lecture online. In the previous video, we got a better understanding of the structure of the Schrodinger equation and what every segment in that equation meant. What we're going to do now is try and understand how the Schrodinger equation helps us figure out the wave equation of a particle. Now, particles end up typically being in real-life situations. For example, they can be bounded in orbits of atoms. They can be bounded by some physical dimensions, typically some potential energy or some voltages or something like that that keeps particles in a particular location and allows particles to move between two limiting fashions or two limiting areas. So what happens then is that those particles usually take on the appearance of existing as a standing wave. Now, of course, a particle isn't a wave, and particles tend not to move like waves, but particles tend to have probabilities, and those probabilities look like waves. In other words, there is a similarity between standing waves on a string and the probabilities where particles can exist. And so it turns out that when particles are limited in some physical structure, that those particles appear to look like they can only exist as a standing wave. There's that, that similarity in here. For example, if a, a particle exists in the innermost orbit of a hydrogen atom, you can see that the particle will act as if it moves like a wave, and the wavelength of that wave is equal to the distance of one orbit around the nucleus. If an electron moves on to the second energy level, where n equals 2, then it, it shows that the distance traveling around the nucleus, one orbit, will equal two wavelengths of that particle. So there's a strong association between the path that particles take and the distance that they're allowed to be in, in this case, in an orbit. It can only exist as it goes around the orbit then you can see that there's an association between the length of that orbit and the number of wavelengths, integer number of wavelengths. If a particle exists in a, what we call a potential well or a one-dimensional box, again, where the particle can exist and how the particle can move back and forth will give it a probability function that looks like a standing wave. If it didn't, the particle actually can exist in that location because when waves are not situated like they are in a standing wave, then there's destructive interference. And the same appears to be true with particles. If a particle, like an electron, would move around the nucleus of an atom, and such that the orbit would be equal to two and a half wavelengths, then there would be destructive interference, and essentially the particle cannot exist there. So the same principle holds true. Now notice that this is the equation, the Schrodinger equation, this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And we have to realize then that we'll, the whole idea is to use the physical situation of the particle, the particle being in an orbit or the particle being in a potential well, and we have to look at the physical dimensions and the boundary conditions to try and come up with expressions that, that give us the energy or the potential energy or the kinetic energy of the particle. We also have to realize that the energy typically is quantized. In other words, it cannot exist in an infinite number of locations. It can only exist in specific locations with specific representation of the wave equation, which then results in specific probability functions. So here we have the n equals 1 location, the lowest energy location, the second energy location, the third energy location, and so forth, each then being associated with specific boundary conditions and specific wave functions. So notice that the energy levels depend upon the what we call the energy quantized levels. So for the n equals 1 level, we have one energy for the particle. For the n equals 2 level, we have another energy for the particle and so forth. So there's quantum jumps between the energy levels that particles can exist at. So keeping that in mind, it all comes down to determining expressions for the potential and kinetic energy and for the total energy and to determine the wave function based on the geometry of the particle, where the particle is located, what the boundary conditions are, and what the physical geometric conditions are of the particle. So when a particle orbits around the orbit of a nucleus, we can then say that the physical dimensions that will determine how we find the wave equation. When the particle is limited to a one-dimensional box or a two-dimensional box, again, the limitations will give us what we need to know about the particle to determine the potential energy, 
the kinetic energy and the total energy of the particle, which will then enable us to find the Schrodinger equation and use the Schrodinger equation to find the wave equation, or better yet, once we have determined the potential kinetic and total energy of the particle, we should be able to figure out the wave equation using the Schrodinger equation. That's a better way of saying it. So hopefully that gives you the, con the context of how we utilize the Schrodinger equation to come up with the wave equation and the probability function of a particle. We really have to look at the physical conditions of where the particle is at, look at the boundary conditions, look at the possibility of how a wave can exist within that physical limit, and that will then help us determine the wave equation. So stay tuned, and we'll show you all kinds of examples of that. That was a better.